is the gita relevant today so i was once uh, in texas now texas is a part of america southern america which is uh, known as the heart of the bible belt where there are a lot of ag- aggressive evangelical christians and there's one boy who met me when i was in the university and he said you know you look like a monk i said yeah he said so which tradition are you from i said uh, i am from the bhakti yoga tradition okay so you know what do you, whatever you do how is it relevant today so he said there are many gospel thumbing preachers that i have met and they give so many discourses about uh, you will go here after that and you will go there after that you know i want to know you religious people you often quarrel and argue and fight among each other and uh, you fight about what is the nature of the other world and you make life in this world worse so <laughs> so he was actually a representative of a thought system we have most of us have heard about theism and atheism so theists are those who accept existence of god atheists are those who don't who reject the existence of god now in between often there are what is called as agnostics those who say that we can't know whether god exists or not but however apart from them there is one more category which is becoming more and more in america if you fill in your and fill in some form about yourself and you have to fill in your religious denomination so and you can you can get an option you, there are various religions the six main religions of the world and others and then at the bottom there's an option none none and obama was the first us president in his presidential address he said that we are a country of diversity we are a country of uh, christian protestants and catholics christians and muslims hindus and buddhists theists and atheists believers and non believers so now now he is not exactly an atheist what is technically called as apatheists apatheist means i don't care whether god exists or not i don't care whether the spiritual stuff is real or not i want to know what difference is it going to make in my life all that i can see is you people whatever you believe and whatever you practice it only makes our world worse so what positive difference does it make so actually i was supposed to give a talk that evening so i had just visited that college some of the devotees were showing me around that college so i told him that i have a talk in this evening uh if you come i have another topic but i'll change this topic and i'll speak on this topic he said oh really okay where is your talk then it was in the main auditorium over there he was a little surprised because he had seen me just uh, walking along the row uh, walking along the footpath okay in the auditorium your talk is there okay i'll come so that's the time when i prepared the stock so is the geeta relevant today so i'll talk about this in broadly four ways so the question that often comes up is that we live in a world of science and technology in a, we live in a world of comfort and prosperity if we just went back about 500 years ago the today and compare that time with today today we have easily available for us things that were unimaginable even for royalty a few hundred years ago we have electricity we have plumbing we have air transportation we have telecommunications none of these was even what to speak of possible even imaginable so the amount of progress we have made in terms of technology is remarkable similarly we have far not all of us but a significant portion of humanity has a significant level of comforts more than in the past so the question comes up that we are progressing why do we need why do we need the gita or any of this religious or spiritual stuff like this so that question is a uh, based on a false premise what is the false premise that actually speaking there are two dimensions to our life there is the outer dimension and there is the inner dimension science
can make things better it is spirituality that can make people better so science has remarkable capacity to improve things and in the outer world and it has done that and yet we see in human history the technology so uh, the technology that has led to so much comfort has also been a tool for so much destruction the last century the 20th, 20th century was the most violent century in recorded human history leave alone the most violent century actually the amount of deaths due to wars and violent crimes combined in the 20th century were seven times more than the number of deaths in all the 19th centuries combined together so we have significant outer power carl jung was a famous uh, western uh, european psychologist and he said that the more outer power we get the more inner power we need the more outer power we get the more inner power we need to be able to use that outer power responsibly otherwise yes we get comforts technology this gives us enormous power but we may use that to hurt each other to destroy each other now we are not blaming technology for this is taking pointing out that technology or prosperity alone cannot completely fulfill the needs of the human person so we need the gita because it offers us another kind of knowledge now what is that kind of knowledge the gita offers so science can provide us speed the we have cars which can move with incredible speed we have airplanes which can move very fast it is the gita can provide us direction yes we can move fast but which direction in life is worth moving are we moving in the right direction now we say yeah what is the idea of right everybody can move wherever they want yes that's fine even the gita acknowledges that humans have intelligence and independence have independence and the gita acknowledges that but nobody wants to move or nobody consciously seeks to move in a direction that is destructive and yet that is what is happening so we have speed but we need direction also so science can provide us the means for living means for living means we can have transportation by which food supply can be brought uh, from one part of foods can be brought from one part of the world to another we can have food clothing shelter and so many of the other needs of our life we can be provided for and to some extent the covid pandemic has revealed that for each one of us the 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 means for living we we were able to stay live digitally we have this class digitally so technology can provide us many resources for living however we human beings also gita the provides us the meaning for living now if you ask uh, siri what's the meaning of life that it gives all kinds of funny answers because that is a question which is very difficult to answer mm. one of my friends is in california and he he is in the mental health care profession and he told me that in this pandemic there there's been a lot of focus on the covid itself and how it is going to take a toll and how to manage balance the lives and the livelihoods uh, that whole dilemma that the whole world is facing he said what is being overlooked is the mental health he he said in the last 3 months and this has been he's been we are talking regularly last 3 months i have received more emergency calls for help than what i have received in the last 20 years of my life why because because of the shutdown of life normal life as we know it because of covid many of the distractions we had we, we no longer have them and then we start asking ourselves now what is the actual meaning of life what am i here for is it that one you know one creature that is utterly invisible to us can bring my whole life to a standstill what is life all about so we need meaning in life as much as we need the means of life so in fact for many people who end up ending their lives who 
commit suicide of course now the politically term correct, correct correct usage is not to commit suicide it is to die by suicide that means they treat suicide not as an act committed by oneself it's like suicide is a disease and you get infected by the disease and you die now that's a, that's a sensitive but tragic way of uh, phrasing the things the point is most people commit suicide not because they are starving yes some people do in utter emergencies but far more people commit suicides because they feel their life has no meaning or whatever they thought was the meaning of life was taken away from them was thwarted from them so is there an enduring meaning for life which can keep keep us keep us moving forever no we don't we don't really fear suffering suffering comes upon everyone in life but what we really fear is meaningless suffering when there's a war the soldiers and even young people from the country will voluntarily go to the battlefield to fight and they know there'll be depri- deprivation over there there'll be privation over there there may be even destruction death over there so they choose all that suffering because it is meaningful that yes i am doing all this for my country so as much as the body needs food that much the human head and heart need meaning and with meaning we can even accept suffering and without meaning even pleasure becomes boring when pleasure becomes boring most of us may think that i want to enjoy life if i ask you if we are face to face you know how many of you like comedies so who doesn't like comedy do we like to who likes to like a good laugh everybody does but if i told you from tomorrow onwards you have no family obligations no financial obligation no social obligations from tomorrow morning to night for the rest of your life you do nothing except watch comedies you might do it for a half an hour an hour if you're very frustrated with things in life maybe for a few days but after some time You, you get fed up of comedies you want to do something meaningful in life it's all just meaningless laughter so with meaning even pain becomes acceptable without meaning even pleasure becomes unacceptable so we need meaning in life and unfortunately science itself doesn't tell us what is the meaning of life in fact the way science reveals the world is no we are just lucky accidents in this cosmos and we are here flapping around for some time and then we die so uh, if we take not a scientific world view but a scientistic world view scientism is different from science scientism is the ideology science is the methodology scientism is the ideology which claims that science is omnipotent sorry is omniscient that science knows everything that all the questions that are worth asking are answered by science and if any question is not answered by science then that question is not worth asking so scientism significantly has no scientific proof scientism itself is unscientific but the point is science cannot tell us what is the meaning of life and albert einstein famously said that you know we can have <clears throat> we can talk about the ethical foundations of science is science being used ethically is science being used mani- meaningfully but it says we can't talk about the scientific foundation of ethics because ethics what makes like meaningful what is moral what is right what is wrong this is something science cannot tell us so again again the point is not to devalue science the point is to recognize that we humans need knowledge of another kind to quote einstein again he said the sciences the arts and the religions they are all trees or they are all fruits of the same tree of human knowledge so now when i say say this is about scientism you know how dare you believe in something that cannot be measured analyzed or peer reviewed now well what about my mother's love does your mother love you well if i ask this question in america it's considered to be unpleasant question to ask because there are some people whose mothers have abandoned them and they grow up in maybe child in children care services or whatever but for most of us we have experienced our mother's love in fact if our mother had not loved us we would not have survived our infancy 
So it is real. But how can we measure it? How can we quantify it? How can we scientifically prove our mother's love? Is there an experiment by which you can say that my mother loves me? No, the mother's love is real. It is what sustains our life, and yet it cannot be scientifically proven. So there is much more to life than what science can provide us. Now, science can provide us entertainment. We can get incredible amount of titillation through entertainment. But Gita can provide us enlightenment. Now, what is it that we want to do beyond just stimulating our senses? How can we live a meaningful life? So, what we live with is important, but what we live for is far more important. Live with. is the resources is the means live for is the purpose the meaning so science can provide us the means for living the gita can provide us the meaning for living what we and what we live for is far more important than what we live with both are important no doubt so with this background i said the simple way is science can provide us a great car but you cannot tell us where to go with that car it is we who decide and for deciding that we we will be helped if we have some information some guidance now if you see this this is a, a classic example of how humans can be put into illusion now which is which which is the movie and which is the person watching the movie hmm? so is the lower part the movie or the upper part the movie hmm? is the so what happens is in the world there can be a lot of confusion and many of you know about movie about movies like matrix which talk about are we living in a virtual world ourselves so now the discussion of what is real and what is not real it is not just a philosophical question it it is often a practical question which matters to each one of us because ultimately we live in the real world we want real relationships somebody may have uh, 5000 friends on facebook but if they are in need do they have one friend who can comfort them so what world is real and what world is not real we need to understand that mm -hmm. now so that was which is actually real so now i'll talk about four an acronym to explain the gita's relevance in four points that acronym is mail m a i l hmm? and we'll talk about the insights that gita provides about the mind about action action means with what motivation we should act in the world then about intelligence uh, and then about love and these four correspond with the four primary teachings of the bhagavad gita they are dhyan yoga will teach us about the mind karma yoga is about action gyan yoga is about the intelligence and bhakti yoga is about love so let's continue now when we talk about the mind the mind is one of the biggest mysteries in modern science the mind definitely is something which exists and influences all of us and yet within the methodology of science there is the mind has no locus standi we have the brain but where is the mind what is the mind now all of us have had trouble with our mind mental health problems are among the most uh, alarming and even ir incurable almost kind of problems not entirely incurable but it is it is a very very exasperating kind of problems a uh, whole genre of problems in fact and among the various species in human existence or in existence it is only humans who can find their mind so unmanageable that their mind can end up killing them no other animal in existence commits suicide now this is not just a comic it's a tragic fact what happens is that time the mind is literally killing the body the mind is destroying the body so understanding the mind again is not a ideal psychological or philosophical curiosity it can well be a existential necessity and the gita begins 
with Krishna and Arjuna having a discussion. And at that time, Arjuna is about to fight a war. The war is to establish dharma, to overthrow an, uh, vicious people who have grabbed power unscrupulously. And yet, before that war begins, Arjuna himself becomes overwhelmed. His mind attacks him. His mind immobilizes him. So I can't fight. I can't fight. And he puts aside his bow. Visrujya sasharam chapam shokasam vigna manasaha. He puts aside his bow saying, I, I can't fight. And that warrior who, who nobody could make him put aside his bow, he voluntarily puts aside his bow because he's overwhelmed by his mind. So the mind can have devastating influences on us. Now, what exactly is the mind? The Gita gives us a very uh, tangible and practical understanding of what the mind is. Tangible means it tells us what the mind is in terms of concrete reality, ontology. And practical means we can use this knowledge to make our life better. So what the Gita says is our existence is three level. There's the body, mind and soul. And that is like a computer system where the hardware, software and user. So the hardware is like the body, the software is the mind and the user is the soul. So <clears throat> if somebody has a brand new phone, but that phone's software is corrupted, it can't work. Similarly, a person may be very healthy and even attractive physically, but if their mind is troubled, then they may not be able to function at all. So the mind is the software inside us. And just as any software can become corrupted by viruses, our mind can also become corrupted. And this is the big problem. That when, when we have when we have when we may have depression and somebody has suicidal urges, when somebody has anxiety disorders, when somebody has uh, attention defi deficit disorders, or so many other kinds of mental health problems. It's basically what is happening is the software is becoming corrupted. And what do we do if a software is getting corrupted? We have, to, we have to cure it. So Krishna says two ways in the sixth chapter. This is text 35. He says that the two ways to cure the mind and that he says is asamshayam mahabaho mano durnigraham chalam is the mind is very difficult to control. But it is possible at two things. Abhyasena to kaunteya vairagyena chagruhiyate. Abhyas and vairagya. Now, what does abhyas and vairagya mean? It can basically mean two things feeding and fencing. Feeding and fencing. What it means is that, say, if you have a software, or let's take a simple example. If, if we have a child, I'll come to the software example. So, if somebody has, a, if you have a child, and the child has to be fed nutritious food. And the child has to be fenced so that child doesn't go into danger. The child doesn't go into go out. There is feeding and fencing. Or going back to software example, if you want to prevent the corruption of the software, what do we do? We first of all put in antivirus program which cleanse the software. We make sure that it is cleaned and nourished. And then afterwards, we have parameters. We don't just put in any CD, any pen drive from anywhere. We don't download in software, any executable programs from anywhere. We're fencing. So feeding and fencing. So the Bhagavad Gita is quite clear. The mind is not our enemy. What is inside the mind is our enemy. We need the mind. The mind is like the software. It is a functional link for us to act in the world. It is a link between us and the body. So what is the enemy is? What is inside the mind? Inside the mind, all kinds of unhealthy emotions, unhealthy desires, unhealthy conceptions are there. So what we need to do is change what we put inside. And that is feeding. That is abhyasa. What we put inside. So for example, now you are hearing spiritual wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. We may put in spiritual stimuli in this way. We may chant the holy names of Krishna. That's also putting in spiritual stimuli. So change what we put inside consciously. And the mind also has a tendency to take things inside. The mind may see some sight over here. And then some sensual sight may go in. And we just stay inside and just get glued to our mind. Be cautious. Be cautious of what stimuli we take inside. So what we put inside, be cautious that is feeding. Abhyasa. And what it takes inside on its own. Like a child, 
may go here go there may go on to the road and try to take eat something some 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 flower some flower or leaf or something which is on the on a shrub outside the fence outside the house no stop it so we put inside constructive things and we avoid damaging things from coming inside and if we do this we each one of us can make a significant difference in dealing with the mind so this is just a inkling of what the mind teach what gita teaches but dhyana is essentially about focusing the mind on the spiritual so that we take in the positive so that is dhyana yoga now let's move on to action action is connected with karma yoga now this is the famous verse from the bhagavad gita 247 it states कर्मण्यवाधिकारस्ते माफलेशु कदाचन मा कर्मफल हेतुर्भूर माते संगोस्तव कर्मणि सो कर्मण्यवाधिकारस्ते कृष्ण सेस द वे टू वर्क द आर्ट ऑफ वर्क इज टू वर्क विदाउट अटैचमेंट टू द रिजल्ट्स नाउ दिस इन टुडे साइकोलॉजी मेक्स नो सेंस एट ऑल because most uh, self help books will tell before you start a work visualize the result you know if you are giving an exam visualize yourself with the uh, with the certificate with the trophy whatever it is you are going to achieve and with that vision in mind work so in one sense is the gita telling the exact opposite and if we don't visualize the result if we don't aspire for the result then why would we work at all So why would the Gita give some such a counterintuitive instru- instruction that work without attachment to the results? Now this is a very significant teaching, and it's simplistic. Now, I was giving a talk in uh, Yale Medical College, and there was a Islamic professor of Hindu studies over there, and he said, "I read the Bhagavad Gita, and this is one thing that never made sense to me." He said, "Right now you are here." because you want all of us to understand what the bhagavad gita says so are you not attached to that result are you not attached to wanting us to understand how can anyone work without attachment to the results so i told him that this verse is not as simple as it seems why because the gita differentiates between goals and results it is not against setting goals it is against being attached to the results and i'll explain what is the difference so usually what happens is we choose actions what i should do and what i should not do based on the results if we feel okay this particular area i'm unlikely to be successful the efforts are too many maybe let me not do this this yeah it's more reasonable so we do it and when we do a particular activity also uh if we get the results we become inflated yeah i am so great i am so glorious i am so successful without results we become deflated from <sighs> useless many times you may see this duality on a tennis court when the winning shot is hit the winner just yahoo the winner jumps up in the sky and the loser just sinks into the ground drooping as if the whole world has ended for them now of course not all tennis players are like that but sometimes we see these extreme dualities so we in in general we we seem to function quite in a result centric way so what's wrong with that so what the gita says is something very significant that see the results are not in our control and when we obsess over the results there is a problem so therefore the gita says be more concerned about what the work does inside you than what it does outside you what does it mean basically so as students we study now obviously when we study we want to get good marks yes that's true however in the long run 5 years 10 years 15 years down the line when you are in a career how many marks you got in which term exam won't make that much of a difference how much you learned the subject and more importantly how much you developed a discipline to study to train your mind to develop a mind that is eager to learn that will make a huge difference so the work does some change outside and the work does some change inside so the gita's focus is don't get so caught in what change the work is going to do outside 
yes i could have got the first rank but i got the second rank or i got the fifth rank yeah that's a difference in the world's eyes it's a big difference right now but in the long run if you have developed an ethos of diligence of discipline of responsibility that will stand you in a good stead einstein also phrased this in a phrased this slightly differently he said be not a person of success be a person of values values is what happens inside us so the gita now of course there are multiple levels at of what we can talk about values but the principle is the gita is telling us that what is outside is not in our control sometimes we may study very very well but just some things happen and maybe we don't get as maybe we fall slightly sick before the exam and we don't get very good marks in the exam because we are not able to perform well does that mean all our studies was in vain no we did to our part we learned we put in the hard work we mastered the subject and more importantly we trained we developed a trained mind to learn that is that is invaluable for sometimes the intangible successes which are the changes that happen inside us we may completely forget them when we get obsessed with the tangible changes in the outside world so in that sense the gita's message be detached from the fruits of the work it is a empowering how empowering because it shifts our attention to what is in our control and not what is out, beyond our control the results outside are beyond our control the results inside are in our control so the gita's message in that sense empowers each one of us so let's look at this from another perspective that these are the four d's in functioning in sanskrit these are called as karma daiva kala so karma is duty kala is duration and daiva is destiny so these three come together to give us the phala the desired result so a simple example could be farming in farming the duty is to uh, sow the seeds and plow the land that's what the farmer does then the destiny is rains have to come in the right time in the right quantity and then the duration is the farmer cannot get the grains the harvest immediately the farmer has to wait till the harvesting season comes so duration has to pass and then the results results come so the, among these four factors if we consider the only factor that is in our control is duty now we are obsessed about the results and we often think that our actions lead to the results it's not that simple yes our actions contribute to the results but they are not the sole cause of the result so when the gita says don't be attached to the results what it means is mate karma phala hetur bhur don't think that you alone are the cause of the results so because we alone are not the cause of the results therefore don't be too worried if the results don't come don't be obsessed with the results don't be elated if the results come don't be dejected if the results don't come do your duty and eventually we will get good results when the duration passes when the destiny becomes favorable the results will come so we need patience and so the detachment which the bhagavad gita talks about is more about acceptance that after i have done what is in my control let me not obsess over that which is not in my control and i st- started this point by saying that there's a difference between goals and results setting goals is perfectly fine in fact after the bhagavad gita was spoken the kurukshetra war was fought and krishna and arjuna were together krishna was the chariot of arjuna and every day during the kurukshetra war arjuna set goals okay this is these are the this is the regiment of the opposite army that i am going to deal with today these are the opposing warriors that i am going to neutralize today famous most famously on the 14th day arjuna said i will bring down jayadrath who was responsible for his devious role in the vicious killing of my son abhimanyu and when arjuna set that goal by sunset today either jayadrath will die or i will die krishna didn't tell him hey arjuna you forgot karmanevadi ka raste no because that's not the implication of karmanevadi ka raste see for us to do our duty wholeheartedly visualizing the goals can motivate us and that's wonderful so the gita is not against visualization of the goals yes we visualize the goals however 
after we have done our duty then let go then understand that this doing the duty was my in my control and doing the duty was my part in getting the results but beyond that i don't have a part so if the results may come they may not come so by this bigger picture we can develop greater steadiness sometimes when results come sometimes the results don't come when results come we won't become proud and arrogant thinking just see i am so great and when results don't come we won't become depressed and deflated thinking i am worthless no i have some capacities let me use my capacities let me do the best that i can and in due course results will come so again karma yoga is a very i just what i talk is a basic introduction to karma yoga it's much more uh, nuanced but this will indicate that it is again a very empowering way of living by which we do all that is in our control and let go of what is not in our control so stephen covey in his uh, seven habits of highly successful people also talks about this idea of circle of control and circle of influence so the bhagavad gita doesn't use that language but karmanne vadhigaraste is talking essentially about the same concept that stephen covey, covey popularized in his uh, seven habits and the gita talks about it thousands of years earlier so karma yoga is about focusing on what is in our control so that is the second part that's action now when you talk about intelligence no intelligence is not just iq iq is no doubt important hmm. at the same time iq alone doesn't guarantee success or happiness there are many high iq high iq people who don't make it big in life who make it big in life but have very very unhappy lives because intelligence iq is just one parameter intelligence is about the decisions we make in our life and the basis on which we make those decisions so this is going back to the earlier point that iq is a resource by which we can do thing if somebody has high iq you know they can do math very fast they can do analytical skills very fast they can have maybe have language processing skills better than others and that's good that's like driving the car very fast but which turns should i take in my life which things are more important which things are less important this is vital to understand and that decision making ability is what it, intelligence essentially is about and we see unfortunately in today's world that this intelligence is not really provided uh, by by mainstream education uh, i when i was in america i was addressing uh, fac- the faculty of an ivy league university so <clears throat> talking in harvard so they're talking about how their students uh, the average student in, in any ivy league university in america they have phenomenal intelligence and they're the best among the best not just in america but the best among the best in the world and yet those students they have they have two prominent emotions one is megalomania and the other is insecurity megalomania means when they see someone else they think if this person is uh, smarter than me then they start feeling insecure and if this person is if i am smarter than that person then i start feeling superior so there is very little emotional stability and because of that they found that, dis- that many of their decisions come from inner insecurity they get into projects they get in they make decisions not based on what is good for their long term career but simply on what will prove their superiority over the next person and that often sabotages them now again i'm not stereotyping ivy league universities the students are often brilliant but this is also a problem there so just because somebody has a high iq doesn't necessarily mean that they will be able to take good decisions so for that we need a broader understanding of what life is meant for and that is what the bhagavad gita provides us the bhagavad gita acts like a guide book for life tasmat shastram pramanam te karya karya vyavasthita gyatva shastra vidhanoktam karma kartum ihar hase that karma kartum ihar hase how take guidelines from scriptures to understand what life is meant for and how to choose 
wisely in life not just based on short term what see feels good but on what long term what is actually good so that intelligence is provided by the wisdom of the bhagavad gita it helps us choose more wisely in our life constantly will face should i do this should i do that should i do this should i do that and our life will be shaped by the how wise our choices are so now intelligence is meant for something higher what do you mean by something higher see we can use our intelligence to say science and technology and various fields they are looking for answers to various questions but what is happening if you look at the modern advancement of knowledge knowledge in one sense knowledge had advanced phenomenally in the last few centuries unfortunately although knowledge has advanced meaning has not advanced in today's world we are living as if it's a vast ocean of knowledge but what does it all mean what is the point of living we all try to grasp some islands of meaning okay my meaning in life is i want to i want to get this degree and i want to get a house like this or i want to make this invention or i want to make this breakthrough okay that's good it's good to have some meaning in life than no meaning at all but what about some ultimate meaning is life just meant ultimately we try to achieve this or achieve that and then we grow old we get sick and we die or sometimes even before that just one bug or one bang can end our life so we find some islets of meaning you know this is my home and these are my degrees and this is my position and this is what shows that i am alive is meaningful and then once storm comes and everything is gone so our we humans have a intelligence which can see long term and which can seek the ultimate so when is the ultimate is understood once our eyes are fixed on the stars then the next steps become easy otherwise if our eyes are not fixed on the stars then we are constantly agonizing should i go take this next step in this direction or this direction or this direction huh so there's an american comedian who who very succinctly put the predicament of life you know in my youth i was confused now i am not so sure <laughs> what is the difference between confused and not so sure that is in my youth i was confused now i am not so sure whether i was confused also or not <laughs> so i am confused about whether i whether i am confused so life can be very very complicated and convincing and unless we have a sense of ultimate meaning unless our eyes are fixed on the stars the many small small choices they can completely paralyze us so we may find this island this island of meaning over here that island of meaning over here but when the tide rises when time passes all the islands get drowned so what is the meaning of life and the gita urges us to inquire this inquire remember shaita dashishi na deliberate and now the, the gita doesn't reject these smaller meanings of life what it says is place them in the context of the ultimate meaning and then life will become supremely meaningful now this is a big subject as i said we have a shortage of time we are not discussing the philosophical part so much right now the last part is love now love is what most movies most roman most novels are about love is what the human heart constantly seeks and yet <clears throat> unfortunately love is what causes the most frustration one of my friends is a marriage counselor in america and he told me there is a, this is a common joke among marriage counselors he said there are only two cup, two kinds of couples who are happy this is those who are lying and those who are not yet married <laughs> so what he meant is relationships are very complicated that we seek relationships for love and those same relationships sometimes end up frustrating us so why is that now to go bef- to before to look at the functional frustration of our love if we look at the current world view that is materialism now what does materialism say materialism means there is nothing more than matter in our lives what does it what does it imply it implies that actually love is nothing except 
some chemical surge in the brain when a mother sees a baby she feels love for the child but what is that love that thing is just a surge in her brain it's just some chemicals rushing through her veins is that what love is love is what gives profound meaning to our lives so what is love now we may talk about it romantically we may get frustrated when it is not fulfilled but before we seek to fulfill it we need to understand what it is and the, with the current world view with the current world view that we have we don't know what it is now now many nowadays with uh, traditional ways of uh, traditional structures of society destabilizing now arranged marriages are not so common now when people want to develop their own relationships then when they want to form a relationship they want to really know does the other person actually care for me that if a boy proposes to a girl i love you now the girl wants to know does is he really love me or does he just uh, want something for me some for something from me uh, so just some physical pleasure from me so the, oh, now how do we know whether a person loves us with all our scientific advancement now we cannot develop anything like a love o meter we have a thermometer a barometer now, as soon as a boy says to a girl i love you okay here let's take this love o meter let's put it on your heart let's see if you really love me now there's no such thing like a love o meter it can't be quantified and yet it is real what is it so what is it actually so this is where the gita offers us its most foundational and transformational understanding what is that the gita says love comes from the source of all love and source of all existence the gita says that the the that god is not just some figure in a image in a temple god is the source and reservoir of all love whatever love we may get from our mother from our father from our relatives pitamas jagato mata dhata pitama whatever love we may get from anyone that love ultimately comes from the divine that divine is known by different names in different traditions the gita knows that divine by the name krishna and in that sense what the gita is saying is that there is an ultimate transcendent source and shelter of love so i'll conclude with this point the gita talks about two kinds of relationships there are the vertical relationship and there is there are horizontal relationships our vertical each one of us has a vertical relationship with krishna and then we have horizontal relationships with others those others could be our our siblings our significant others and in future we may have kids we have parents all those others there we have relationship with them and yes we may find many things lovable in them and those things that are lovable are true at the same time the gita explains each of us are like parts of the divine we are all parts of krishna and we all can manifest parts of the love that he can manifest so yes even the loving relationships in this world if they if they work out they can be very fulfilling unfortunately even the most fulfilling relationship ends because it's temporary it's a drop and now rather than the gita's attitude is not a, it's a drop it's so insignificant forget it no that's not the attitude of the gita the gita says it's a drop and even this drop can be so fulfilling so just visualize just imagine how much more the ocean can be fulfilling so whatever we find lovable in anyone that lovability finds its source and fulfillment in krishna this is a whole big subject but the point is the gita provides us a foundation a foundation and direction for our love it doesn't reject worldly relationships but it integrates worldly relationships with the transcendental relationship and in this way the gita explains where does love come from it comes from the divine it may come through various channels to us in this world and we certainly need to reciprocate and uh, reciprocate with those who are offering love to us so at the same time we need to see that there are channels and beyond the channel is the source sometimes the channel may be there for us sometimes the channel may not be there for us if we obsess over the channel alone then uh, if that if we 
okay, this person is the most important person in my life. Some, sometimes some people ask this question that, do in our, our matches made in heaven, does everyone have a perfect partner whom, partner whom God has ordained for each one of us? Well, you know, this question, it, it sounds romantically very exciting. But the fact is that it's neither philosophically nor logically sound. I'm not going to philosophically, but simply logically. Say if there are 50, if there are say 26 couples, you know, there is A1, A1 and A2. So A1 is a male, A2 is a female. Let's for now assume that we have all state or heterosexual relation. And A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And they're all meant to marry each other. Now, that's, that's the perfect match for everyone. If that's the conception, all that is required is one person make a wrong choice. So if A1 decides to marry C1, then whom does A2 marry? And then whom does C2 marry? And A2 marries B2. And then C2 marries D2. And then everything, there can be a domino effect and everyone can go wrong. So this idea of... Now, our horizontal relationship with each other are important. And the point is not to minimize them. But the point is to recognize that we, if we expect from any human being the fulfillment that only the divine being can provide, we set ourselves up for frustration. If we understand things properly, that yes, no human being can be a substitute for the divine being. So ultimately, all love comes from the divine and is meant to take us toward the divine. With that understanding, we don't have unrealistic expectations in our relationships. And that's how we can make our relationships work much more tangibly for us, much more sustainably for us. So Bhakti Yoga is not just about relationship with the Lord. And it's certainly not just sentiment, uh, sentiment, uh, uh, some kind of crying in uh, tears. It is a whole, you could say, a sophisticated science of love which encompasses all love in existence. So that is what the Bhagavad Gita teaches. And this, these are just few, four samples of the Gita's eminent relevance that I have given. And each of these aspects, one addresses one, one important aspect of our being. The psychological aspect that's addressed by the mind, the practical aspect that's ad addressed by actions, the the intellectual aspect is by the, uh, 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 as addressed by the intelligence and the existential, the ultimate heart's aspect is addressed by love. So this is what makes the Gita not just relevant today, but relevant eternally, relevant perennially. It is eminently relevant for all time to come. So I'll quickly summarize in a minute or two, then we can have questions. So today I spoke about the relevance of the Gita in the age of science and technology, why do we need it? Because technology and prosperity, they are valuable, but they themselves don't fulfill the human being. Why? They can provide us comforts, but what, what do we do with the comfortable life? They can provide us means, but not meaning. They can provide us speed, but not direction. They can provide us entertainment, but not enlightenment. They can provide us things to live with, but it is Gita which tells us how, what to live for. And in that connection, I talked about four asp aspects of the Gita's relevance. The first is the mind which, within science. It's very difficult to, in the reductionistic science itself, especially, what is the mind? It's very difficult to understand. But the Gita says the mind is like a software. And the software can get corrupted. And today it is getting corrupted repeatedly. The deal To deal with it, what do we do? Feeding and fencing, abhyas and vairagya. Take good inside consciously and avoid the mind taking in bad without our notice also. And then talk about action. When the Gita talks about work with detachment, that doesn't mean don't set goals, don't visualize. It means know your part. What is in your control is actions. Actions alone don't produce results. Action plus duration plus destiny produce results. So when we are doing our actions, do it wholeheartedly. And to do that wholeheartedly, you can set goals. But after it's done, let go. Knowing that the results are beyond me. And this understanding is actually empowering for us to function 
the Gita is more concerned about bringing about a change inside us through our work than the change outside us. Uh, the values that can make us more sustainably successful than just one-time success that might come by the success of our work. Mm, so then I talked about the uh, I intelligence. Intelligence is not about about IQ. It is about taking sound decisions in life. And the Gita provides us an overall context for life in which we can take sound decisions. And last was, D was, uh, uh, male L was love, that love is not just some chemical pulsation in the brain. And now love is not just some sentiment that is going to be frustrated by time. Love is that which unites us with the source of all love. And it is not world rejecting, it can be world embracing if understood holistically. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Proji. <laughs> Your first part uh, so beautifully, uh, you explained how what uh, science can offer and what spirituality can offer, what Gita offers. And your second part of uh, the male acronym so beautifully summarized the four yoga systems which Krishna explains in the Gita. And a glimpse of all four of them. Uh, Roji, we have some questions on the chat box. So, should I ask the question? Uh, what is written? I can read out also, whatever you feel. Yeah. Should, uh, you want to choose? You can choose, otherwise I'll read out and I'll answer. Whatever you feel. Yeah, you can you can take Roji. Then you can directly take from the chat box. Okay. So, if marriages are made in heaven, then why few people, couples all over the world are taking divorce? Okay. I, that's what I said. Marriages are not made in heaven. To think that marriages are preordained is illusion. It is not that way. It is we have to make our relationships work and we can make them work if we understand what to expect from each other. Now, I didn't say to stop expecting anything from others. I said stop over expecting from others. Over expecting means, especially in romantic love, uh, we create an image of the other person. We create a fantasy which actually no human being can fulfill. Yes, everybody has reasonable expectations in every relationship. And sometimes other person may not live up to our expectations in some ways. And sometimes they may exceed our expectations in some ways. So it's not that we don't expect anything, but we don't, we can't expect a human being to ever fulfill all our heart's longings. It is not going to happen. So no, we don't have unrealistic expectations. So by interacting with people over a period of time, we learn, we understand what is a realistic expectation. So, how do we balance between material activity and spiritual activity? Two things. First is that we understand that everything has its place in life. And we can't replace one thing by the other. That means that just like we have to take food. We have to take food, we have to take food. We have to earn food, we have to earn our living. So means for living are important. But means for living can't substitute for meaning for living. So what is the exact balance? That varies from time to time, from phase to phase in life. So in the Vedic culture, there are different phases in life. There, is the, there, are, there are different ashramas. So we have to find out based on our time, place, circumstance, what is the balance? Generally, we start our day with some spiritual activities, investing some time in connecting our consciousness with Krishna. And then when we are doing our work, we will be having that spiritual understanding, spiritual consciousness by which we can work. And then in the evening, we try to reconnect with Krishna. So Narayana Eti Samarpayami. In that way, even our material activities become devoted to the Lord. So generally, I have a balance. The exact quantity for the balance will vary. But we need regular reconnection with the spiritual side of life so that we can stay grounded. Now, exactly how much that varies from person to person. It says different people eat different quantities of food. Different people require different levels of uh, comfort and prosperity to move on in their lives. But just as food alone, a person can't spend their life eating food. There are other things in life also. So similarly, a person can't spend time just earning money. Making money is important. What we are making with money is even more important. After we earn money, what are we using with that money for? 
otherwise the person may have a huge amount of money and in earning money they alienated their friends they alienated their family they, they didn't have time for them and then they have a huge house and i actually met people like this they have a huge house that only offers them a, the privilege of a lot of place in which to feel lonely and unhappy what is the use of unbalanced life like that so if a person has five talents and they want to one is professional remaining are like hobby or interest if you want to continue all talents well some people feel that they have too little talents some of us feel we may have too many talents so we can pray and try to connect within prayer is very powerful and not just praying writing down our thoughts in a prayerful mood i do seminars on journaling for decision making so those i do in courses to for guided journaling so writing down our thoughts is very helpful so writing clarifies our thinking so write pray reread what you have written what is how important is this 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 and then take decisions and then we may decide that right now this is the most important thing for me later on that other thing can be important but rather than just thinking i have to take this decision all alone seek divine guidance so if we try to connect with the divine connect with the lord through prayer through meditation through study of scriptures then we will be able to have sounder guidance for uh sounder guidance uh sound greater wisdom in making our decisions okay do we have 100% control of our destiny if we work with devotion no 100% control of destiny would mean that we would be god and devotion is not meant to make us god devotion is meant to make us devoted to god so even for those who are, are devoted it's not that everything that they desire is going to happen arjuna didn't want any of his sons to die and yet on the kurukshetra war he was completely devoted to krishna and not just one or two iravan was the first son he died and abhimanyu was the second son who died and eventually all his sons died so yes things are not in our control some things are some things are not so this in today's world often the idea is my greatness is that i never take no for an answer whatever i want i get and there's nobody who really lives like that everybody has to take no for an answer at times in life that's because we all have to bend to the will of destiny so devotion doesn't mean that destiny will always become favorable for us devotion if we become devoted what it means is that whatever happens we will see a favorable way ahead through it there's a difference that it is destiny doesn't mean that whatever we desire will happen but rather whatever happens we will see a desirable way through it that is the intelligence that devotion can give us dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upayantite that is i'll give the intelligence by which you can come to me you can make you can choose wisely so how can we maintain the calmness of the mind when we get, when we get affected and we lament well first thing is that be be patient with yourself the mind is like a child and children are restless children are emotional children will go up and down so don't be too hard with yourself and secondly try to analyze after the emotion has gone made it up and down look back and see which part of the emo- situation was and my control under my control which part of the situation was not in my control so the more we understand okay in this situation you know maybe if i had responded this way instead of reacting this way that would have made a big difference oh okay so learn learn so don't just think in terms of uh, success in controlling the mind is not digital one or zero it is analog analog means that sometimes we may even after practicing spirituality we may fluctuate but the magnitude of the fluctuation may be much lesser initially it's like the highs are in the seventh heaven and the lows are in the deepest levels of hell but we'll be steady as we'll be happy but not jump not elated not and will not be completely miserable when things go wrong will there will be greater amount of equanimity 
yes so if we get attracted to something then uh, even while you are practicing bhakti is it krishna testing us yes possibly now it is not that we are meant to reject everything attractive in this world we have to see whether that attraction is within the purpose of my life whether it is within the in harmony with the principles of dharma if it is then that's it's not that we all attract to things that have to be rejected in the world but we have to make sure that we don't get caught in the attractive things of the world and become distracted from krishna distracted from the meaningful things in our life yes the soulmate concept yes soulmate is a very popular idea so whenever people ask me about a soulmate i tell them it's more important to focus this on the soul than on the mate understand what is the soul first don't so we worried so much don't we so worried about the mate part now if everything is predetermined can we change our fate by our action well everything is not predetermined mm. how do we know that everything is not predetermined there are simple ways of understanding this from uh, the philosophical perspective we understand that a that the spiritual traditions and god himself has given books of wisdom and guidance do this and don't do this so if we had if everything were predetermined and why would god tell us do this and don't do this if we had no free will to do something to make some choices so we could say that destiny determines our situations we determine our decisions destiny determines our situations say if we are driving if we go from if i drive my car and we want to go from say mm, oh uh, say mumbai to delhi or mumbai to pune now if it's a very heavy storm that storm is determined by destiny but in the storm how i drive that's up to me i can drive recklessly and meet with a horrible accident i can drive safely and reach my destination i can slow down and wait till the storm passes that's up to me so everything is not determined by destiny our situations are determined by destiny our decisions are determined by us another way i put it is that destiny may determine the complexion of our face we determine the expression on our face a person may have a very attractive face cut but if they are always scowling and glaring they will not look very attractive for very long on the other hand a person may not have that attractive a face cut but if they are cheerful and smiling and their eyes are sparkling now they will be attractive so destiny doesn't determine everything what about the pride movement those people who who fall for the same gender it's complicated what the bhagavad gita explains is that normally when a soul goes from one body to another body the soul ends up uh, the soul usually identifies with that next body but unfortunately for some people if uh, what happens is the soul goes to the next body but the soul doesn't identify with that body let me explain this so these are the three levels of identity talk there's there's a soul which is who we are around the soul there is the mind and then there is the body so now the soul is our at the level of the soul is our essential identity who we essentially are fundamentally are at the level of our mind is our felt identity who we think we are and at the level of the body is our physical identity physical identity so that means what kind of body we have so now what happens is for most people their felt identity plus their physical identity is their bodily identity felt identity means say if i if i am in a male body hmm, and my mind identifies with that so i think of myself as a male now actually we are neither male nor female we are ultimately souls and the soul is beyond material gender but we are talking about a bodily identity right now so the felt identity is the psychological identity we could say and then the physical identity together they comprise the bodily identity for most people it is the same their felt identity and their physical identity are the same now as i said bodily identity is not the essential identity however what happens for some people is 
Hmm. So the normal way of living is we function appropriately as per bodily identity. So if I'm in a male body, I act like a male. If I'm in a female body, I act like a female. And while we strive to realize our spiritual identity, but the problem is sometimes there is a double illusory identification. Unusual illusory identification means if a soul was say in a female body before, and the soul comes to the male body now, but somehow. the mind is still identifying with the previous body that means the person is in a male body right now but the person is identifying with the female body then what happens is the felt identity and the physical identity the two become opposite and that's when there is gender gender dysphoria can happen and for people whom it's not just an occasional thing then it can lead to homosexuality and other things like that so the the problem here is that Uh, the felt identity and the physical identity are two different things so that's when the problem comes up so now the problem with the pride movement or those who are um, i have friends who are who are gays and i talk with them and many of them are very balanced people so they understand that i am different from everyone else in this one degree in this one sense and otherwise i am similar but there are some who make their sexual orientation their entire defining identity and i think because i am different so the whole of society should be changed to accommodate my difference my being different so no that doesn't have to be done so the nature of the problem what they feel is that the problem is a matter of category but the problem is actually a matter of degree what do i mean matter of degree or matter of category see nobody feels at home in their body everybody feels maybe i am too i am i am too overweight i am too thin i am too fair i am too dark i am too tall i am too short nobody feels completely at home with their body now of course i am not minimizing the degree of uh, 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 disorientation that some people might feel but the principle here is and it's a matter of degree whereas the matter of category is that when some people think that because i don't identify with my body so what should i do you know the whole society has to change to accommodate me then i want to do surgeries to change things and i want to completely be a different person then society has to accommodate me well no the bhagavad gita explains why there might be non standard sexual orientations and uh, it and it explains why that is happening the problem comes when somebody makes that as as you said the pride movement in india that's a matter of pride and they want to disrupt all the structures that have sustained human society for millennia because of their individual differences and again i would say that even among the pride movement in the in the pride movement speaks for gays but it doesn't speak for gays in the sense there are many gays by gays i'm using inclusively for gays and lesbians everyone that they just don't they just want to go on with their life they don't want to make it a big issue for which they want to agitate for the rest of their life that is just one part of who i am and okay that's one part now accommodate me and move on with my life so i would say that the bhagavad gita can ensure that the sexual orientation doesn't consume a person's life completely now that sexu- the sexuality sexuality is a part of our being a human being but sexuality shouldn't define our humanity it shouldn't define our personality so the bhagavad gita's philosophy can give a balanced understanding where one understands why one feels the way one does and one finds a way to act appropriately but what one doesn't make it the defining mission of one's life and then let the sexual identity consume one's entire life or identity itself okay so prabhu it's already 8:30 should we stop can we take this last one question which one yes. uh, prabhu ji for an instant we find ourselves standing in amidst of confusions and conflicting thoughts all seemingly potentially true at that moment how to take some particular decision as no one else will feel the situation 
that we are feeling except krishna okay so how do we decide when we feel conflicting emotions and no one can understand our emotions yes that's always a challenge that's why rather than resting our life on our emotions we need an overall plan and purpose for our life and based on that plan and purpose that, that's where see, the bhagavad gita is not about micro manage managing us the bhagavad gita didn't tell Ar- krishna was not telling arjuna throughout the battle hey don't shoot the arrow here shoot the arrow here shoot the arrow here. don't shoot don't shoot the arrow here. don't shoot the arrow here krishna was with arjuna but krishna was most of the time letting arjuna use his intelligence and expertise to decide how to fight with which warrior at critical times he was giving guidance although god was right next to arjuna god was not trying to micro control arjuna so there are many decisions we have to make on our own but what happens is if we are adequately spiritually connected that means we spend enough time in developing our spiritual connection then that gives us a steady foundation then our emotions which may arise from the situations they don't sweep us away and then we can have a clearer sense of a direction and clarity for making our decisions so yes in the moment sometimes we make decisions right sometimes we make decisions wrong nobody can in life guarantee that all the decisions that they will make will always be right that's just the way that's just the part of our being finite living beings so what can we do rather than worrying about whether this decision is right or wrong we focus more on trying to m- make our decision making ability better and how do we do that by grounding ourselves in our spirituality so our spiritual connection is like an anchor and the uh, emotions are like waves now some waves can be stormy and they can just sweep us away but if we have ha- or holding on to an anchor then the waves may hit us they may shake us but they won't sweep us away so the stronger our spiritual connection the lesser our decisions will be solely driven by our emotions it is not that emotions shouldn't be considered in making decisions but they shouldn't be the sole consideration for making decisions so the gita doesn't micro even attempt to micro control our life because each one of us is individual facing individual challenges but the gita tries to equip us with a sounder decision making ability okay so thank you very much for your thoughtful questions hare krishna Bhagavad thank you so much prabhuji jai krishna yeah. prabhupad ki jai Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Thank you very much for you Hare Krishna